Good morning and welcome to Morning Prayer, wherever you are in the world, feel welcome. We are in the city of Tyler in East Texas and we've come to the Rose Garden because Tyler is one of the great rose growing centers of the United States. The roses here in this garden are past their first flush of flowering, uh, but there's still some flowers as you see around us and these Banksyi roses on each side have lost their flowers now. But you see what an enormous garden this is. It spreads right out into the, into the distance. And uh, at a particular time of year, there's a rose festival. But we've got someone here who later on will help us understand this rose garden a little and speak about the cultural life of the city of Tyler. But meanwhile, we're going to say our morning prayer in this window between the Feast of Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit, and the Feast of the Holy Trinity, which completes really the, the sequence of really special things before we enter ordinary time. So this morning there's this lull between Pentecost and Trinity and we'll look at the New Testament in the Acts of the Apostles telling that particular story. But for the moment let's begin our morning prayers in the normal way. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. The canticle is from the first song of Isaiah. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense and he will be my saviour. Therefore you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. And on that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things. And this is known in all the world cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion, ring out your joy, for the Great One in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be for ever. Amen. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and for ever. Amen. Our psalm this morning, on this Tuesday morning, is Psalm 23. And I'm using the King James Version of that very favourite psalm for so many. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our lesson, naturally enough, comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. This is after the day of Pentecost, but there is seemingly a lull in the hostility towards the friends of Jesus as they begin to proclaim the good news in the city of Jerusalem and the regularity of their presence in the temple is made clear here. 
So this is chapter 3 of the Acts of the Apostles and we are reading up to verse 16. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And the man fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, the man stood and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though in our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Peter giving the good news. It's wonderful to hear that sound in the background. I'd know I was in the United States the moment I heard the train sounding. It's one of the great sounds as a train passing by in the distance here. Peter and John at that time regularly worshipping in the temple at the hour of prayer, three o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour, just as we read in St. Luke's Gospel that Jesus went to synagogue, as was his custom. There's a regularity of public worship in all this, in the same way as there is much uh, preaching of the good news in the open air, outside, amongst the crowds. And this rhythm is something that we have kept up too. So we are saying our morning prayer according to the prayers of the church, and at the same time, we're out in the open air this morning doing that in this beautiful place, this city of Tyler. Normally we've, we've looked to see what kind of dates gave us an anniversary on this day. And today's a rather interesting one because there are four dates of significance. There are many more, but I've chosen four dates of significance to help us in our understanding. The first one is the fact that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was born on May the 22nd, 1859. He was born in Edinburgh. And Conan Doyle, of course, is, is known as a writer, but especially he's known as the creator of Sherlock Holmes, the detective, with his companion, Dr. Watson. It's a sequence of stories 
And when uh, Conan Doyle tried to stop writing them, there was a public outcry and he had to recreate Sherlock Holmes, whom he thought he had, had written his last story about, and write some more. I used to be fascinated by these detective tales when, when I was young, and I've got the, the whole collected story of uh, stories of, of Sherlock Holmes in that way. He created a world where you helped him solve the problem, and all the clues were there in the stories as they went along. He's the first of these anniversary dates which create a world into which we enter. And when we're reading, we know all sorts of facts about that world and at the same time are um, helped to solve the puzzle by all the evidence given. The next person who created a world for us in so many different ways is the actor Sir Laurence Olivier. He was born on this day in 1907 and he brought the stories of so many alive in films like Wuthering Heights where he plays Heathcliff or in films like Pride and Prejudice where he plays Mr Darcy but at the same time so many Shakespearean roles which some of you may have, have seen and certainly the films that he made of King Henry V are classics of their type. Olivier was someone who could create a world just as Conan Doyle did. Olivier did it by his drama, by his acting and by his command of the stage and we could enter into that in heart and soul and give thanks for humanity's creative gifts enabling us to do just that. The next person who was born today in 1813 was the composer, and let's say mostly the opera composer, Richard Wagner. Wagner began by writing operas which were quite simple and in a smaller scale, operas like Rienzi or operas like The Flying Dutchman, uh, which are, are of a normal length for, for operas and hugely enjoyable. Operas like Lohengrin, but then suddenly he took to taking the folk tales of his country and creating huge operas. And certainly the quartet of operas which form the ring cycle, which are performed on all um, major opera house stages and particularly in Bayreuth in, in, in Germany, in Bavaria, um, all, of, all of those are massive works and you're taken by the music into a different world. It's a world similar to Tolkien's world of the Lord of the Rings, but this is opera and the music carries you there, instrumental music and also uh, choruses and solos of grand dimension. It's the same with the enormous opera, the Meistersingers of Nuremberg, telling the story of that guild which had great music and a song festival each year, just as this place has a rose festival in the same way. So we give thanks for the, the magnificent music of Richard Wagner. And that too, by its music, can take us into another world. So we have Conan Doyle with his detective puzzles taking us into one world and we have Laurence Olivier with his acting skills taking us into many worlds and Richard Wagner with his music causing us to know the, 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 the wonderful capacity of entering into a world of mystery as well as of folk tales and then suddenly we have the last one of these, uh, Victor Hugo. He was not born on May the 22nd, he died on May the 22nd in 1885 and we have um, his uh, various works. The French think of him as a great poet, we tend to think of him as a, 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 a writer of great stories and none more so than Les Miserables, which oddly uh, was taken f um, in, uh, was written rather on the island of Guernsey in the Channel Islands because he was in exile at that point as he had left France as he mightily disapproved of the government of the Emperor Napoleon III. 
So at first he put himself in self-imposed exile in Brussels, wrote many things. It's always said that every morning when he got up, he would either write so many lines of, of poetry or else 50 full scat pages of a novel. And when he removed from Brussels to exile on the Channel Islands and especially the island of Guernsey where he went in 1855 and didn't return to Paris till I think 1871. At that time he wrote his most famous novel, Les Miserables. And Les Miserables now has become even more famous both as a film and as a musical and the film of the musical and London and um, New York and many uh, opera places across the world showing this. In fact, uh, our own, our own um, uh, school put this on in a magnificent way uh, and, and, and played this as a, as a show, as an opera show, in the Playhouse in, in Canterbury when we were there. The story of, of how the police inspector, through one government after another, will not let go of the justice that he's seeking to capture Jean Valjean. Uh, and uh, that story is, is so dramatic. It's become another world into which we enter. So we give thanks for all of these. We remember on the island of Guernsey, going to the, the Candy Gardens, as they're called, and on the island of, of Guernsey, there's a statue given by the French government, a statue of Victor Hugo, looking out across those beautiful gardens at St. Peterport, and around is a flower bed and little quotations of Hugo's works in English are set amongst the flowers as though flowering themselves. Um, that here are some of them. Uh, to love another person is to see the face of God. Or, there is nothing like a dream to create the future. Or, music expresses that which cannot be put into words and that which cannot remain silent. And then, have courage for the great sorrows of life and patience for the small ones. And when you have laboriously accomplished your daily task, go to sleep in peace, for God is awake. And lastly, he who does not weep does not see. All of those like little flowers blooming and still the house where Victor Hugo lived in St. Peterport. Oatville House is, is there marked. Uh, and he wrote one novel, Toilers to the Sea in English, which was a tribute to the citizens of Guernsey, that island in the Channel Islands, who looked after him and became his home during those years of exile. We remember well the librettist of the uh, musical Les Miserables, Herbert Kretzmer, whom we met at the home of our friend uh, Phyllis Sons, and we were looking forward to conversations and working with him in a different way, but sadly he passed away before that became possible. We give thanks for him uh, creating another world, not just of the novel, but taking the story of the novel and making it into something which was understandable of people, but also a joyful praise, almost a prayer to God by the time one had finished this wonderful operation. But here we are in Tyler, and so I'm going to ask someone who knows much more about Tyler than we do, our friend Weston Jennings. Weston, come and join me on the, <laughs> on the seat here and uh, say good morning to the, the garden congregation. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're staying with Weston at the moment. Weston was, a few years ago, our organ scholar in Canterbury, but now has a, a massive life uh, of, of organ playing and knowledge about organs, and at the same time you're a plantsman and a gardener. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the city of Tyler first, too, and why all these roses? So the city of Tyler is really um, a central part of Northeast Texas and East Texas in general. It's the seat of Smith County. And as we can see, it's known so well for its uh, rose cultivation and production that really started in the 30s. And I believe there was a, a blight in one of the fruit crops and then they were uh, looking for what they would uh, develop next. And they discovered that roses really love to live right here in Tyler. Yeah. 
And uh, this particular site that we're at now was purchased, I believe, in 1912. And uh, during the uh, Works Project Administration in the late 30s, uh, a grant was received to develop this site. And um, for a long time, it was also the home uh, to our East Texas Fair, just across the way there. Right. And so there's, this has always been a, a, a real hub of activity here. Sure. Now, tell us about your, before you tell us about your garden at home, tell us about your, your role here. So I am director of music and organist at First Presbyterian Church. And uh, First Presbyterian Church is one of the um, older uh, churches here in Tyler. And uh, just a couple of years ago, we celebrated 150 years. And uh, I work with uh, the largest organ in East Texas. <laughs> right. It's a beautiful instrument by Cassidy. We've heard it. I agree with that. And yeah. um, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to uh, not only work with the instrument, but the, the wonderful choirs and, and different musical things that are going on. And um, you'll also hopefully get to hear a little bit of, of the organ uh, Def now. Definitely you will. Uh, uh, Fletcher will make sure we get some of that, I know. Uh, at the same time, you've always had an interest in organs ever since your early years, yes? Yes, uh, I came to the organ a little bit on the later side. I was almost 17 when I started playing the organ, but I'd been playing piano since I was quite young. Yeah. And when I saw the different sound colors and the, the capabilities uh, of the instrument, I really just fell in love. And uh, since then, uh, it's, it's taken me all over the world, uh, including yeah, uh, the wonderful Canterbury <laughs> Cathedral, <laughs> where, yes. where we met. and. Um, it's uh, sort of carried me through my days. Indeed, it's great to find you here with your, your, your own organ in that, that mighty and beautiful church. And we received all the lovely hospitality of your community yesterday, and that was a, a great event. But at the same time, you've always had a, an interest in growing plants and creating gardens. Yes, I have. <laughs> Wait for the gardener to go past. I, I, I have had an interest in, in gardening and plants, and so when I moved to the uh, current home I'm in, I am very fortunate that there's a, a small yard, and I have uh, very strong ideas about native plantings and uh, companion plantings and all sorts of things like that. I, I have roses as well, yeah, I'm and seeing, uh, yes, all sorts yeah. of sort of older roses and very fragrant roses, and I just love the way that you can um, have this image in your mind of how you might want to wander through the the garden and how you want it to affect you personally and and uh, the different colors and the different bloom seasons and um, so it, it really keeps me me busy. <laughs> let me let me just translate the word yard for for, for, for people uh, who are from England because in England we use the the, the word yard for a, should we say a concrete space? Yes. Uh, and in America it can be the most beautiful garden and that yes. would be your yard, your backyard, and your, that's exactly what we're talking about there. Yes. So that. Uh, I think that, that people then get that vision of, of that. Tell us also about our perceptions of East Texas, because we had thought that would be a dusty sort of <laughs> ranch filled thing with, with cattle and no greenery at all. It's not like that a bit, is it? Yes, so a lot of people have this idea of all of Texas, this great, wonderful state, that it's it's just covered with tumbleweed and dust and, <laughs> and <laughs> horse ranches and that yeah, sort yeah. of thing. And uh, that is really this, this image of West Texas that yep. Hollywood has has taken and run with and so we all have that vision yeah. but here in East Texas we have 
we have grasses, we have pine trees, yeah. we have water, yeah. uh, we have uh, hills, yes. we have a slightly more temperate climate, although today um, uh, is... I would say we're getting really into the hot season now for yeah. me, yeah. and then it becomes devilishly hot as we yeah. get into July and and by August. Yeah. Uh, but there are, there's a wealth of um, of just rich soil here, and yeah. it's different. We're we're close to Dallas. Yeah. But the soil changes dramatically. Right. And uh, here it's just so much better for all the plants that we love. Right, and, and, yes, yeah. And we don't have to um, be finicky about amending the soil too much. Yep. I mean, you can amend it to your heart's content. Yes. But so many of these plants, as we'll look later, the camellias and the azaleas particularly, yes. really love this environment. Yeah, many of the house plants that we use and have to have shelter in England all the time are really fruitful here and flowering. And as we came up, from Houston, driving up through, we just passed so many green landscapes <laughs> with, with beautiful trees and all along the freeways were, were wildflowers growing. And I think that was due to one of your president's wives. Yes, Lady Bird Johnson uh, was, was very responsible in uh, getting the, the energy behind that project and making these uh, beautiful really beautiful um, roads that are that are surrounded by these wildflowers. They are, and, and many of the wildflowers are things that we would consider garden flowers only, <laughs> and, and they grow in that way, but here they're all along the banks, which is just wonderful to see. Uh, speaking of flowers, um, every March there is, um, there are the azalea trails here, and uh, you've noticed that as we approach a First Presbyterian Church, we go through our historic uh, neighborhoods, yep. uh, including the brick streets, and all of those houses just have a um, beautiful array of azaleas. And there's a period of two weeks every spring that visitors flock here to enjoy uh, the beauty of the azaleas. Now, they don't always get the dates right, so sometimes <laughs> they might have gone by the time the right. festival is happening, the azalea yeah. trail. Yes, yes. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's a really fun time, really marks spring for us, and it's, it's beautiful. And that's probably just before the first flush of roses come out. Right. So it's a lot of a lot of flower going on here in the spring. Now your other skill in choral singing, you, you gather groups of people together in the church there with full facilities for letting them sing and you've got something like that happening next week, have you? Yes, happening? so yeah. uh, next week is um, the end of our fine arts season and so that's a series of concerts that, uh, that span from September through June and uh, next week actually we have a chamber orchestra called right. New Texas Symphonia right. and they are performing Copeland's Appalachian Spring. Oh, wonderful. With some Nothing other better. companion yeah, yeah, pieces as well. Yes, yes. Um, by Mio, uh, uh, James Lentini, and... Um, and Coleridge Taylor as well. Oh, right. And just kind of putting that all together. Uh, and it, it's really fun. Uh, we have a great time. And this one's particularly exciting because it is the end of a season that has it really included some wonderful performances. Right. And uh, But we've got choral, instrumental, um, brass, organ, whatever you desire, right. early right. music, it's all there. And, and I have the great pleasure of sort of compiling that and putting that together every year. Gosh, the only thing of, I've ever had to sing of, of Coleridge Taylor was the Song of Hiawatha, oh, okay. <laughs> which is a wonderful choral piece on the way yes. through, and, and, and uh, the, the wedding uh, songs and things of that sort yes. just captures Beautiful this area. Stuff. It he, is. He has a set of four novelettes, yes. and we're performing the first one, and it's for uh, string, uh, strings and triangle, I think. Right, right. <laughs> it's a, it's, really uh, it's a good combination. It's really good to be here with you. It's, it's been quite a sort of catch-up, hasn't it, in talking yes. about how we've come through since the last time we saw you. And your year was 2013 that sort of time yes, was I, it? I arrived in Canterbury August of 2013 and uh, stayed on in England for a second year and, and you know happy with, to return as well and uh, yeah. I try to every summer but yep. uh, sometimes yep. it doesn't work out. Well we hope you can <laughs> th this year. I'd love to. Uh, Rose Festival. Yes. yes tell us about the Rose Festival. So once the uh, they discovered that roses did so well here um, there was sort of a, a, a cultural um, festival that sprang out of that and that's been going on since the 30s yeah. and every October thousands of visitors flock to Tyler um, and they gather in various places yeah. uh, they gather in uh, just here on the courtyard and there is a, a crowning of the 
uh, the Rose Queen, and there's a great history. We were actually uh, at a, a location yesterday that had this grand display of all the Rose Queens, and here at the uh, Rose Garden Center, they have a museum uh, to the festival, and you can see all of the um, the dresses, the uh, you know all yeah. of the all of the finery <laughs> that they um, don for the festival, and uh, there are photos of the. The, the courts and the different um, various roles that have to be filled every year um, for this grand festival in October. It's very good for cities like this to have traditions, isn't it? Yes. And, and, and feel this is when we all gather then and people come to join them and, and enjoy the atmosphere of the city. And we've certainly enjoyed it, even though it's not Rose Festival time. It's, it's been a, a really good time. Yes, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you could be here when you can. We still get to see some of the roses yeah. that are in bloom and uh, like I said we're just at the beginning of, of the summertime for us and yeah. so it's not too hot we're able to sit here and still uh, be in the sun and not dying sure yeah, we're not <laughs> dying quite yet no. stay on and I'll, we'll just finish off our little service here Thanks. and then um, we'll uh, bless the people and and we can all go our way this is the collect the special prayer for today. O oh God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we say together the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. So we end our morning prayer here in Tyler and give thanks not only to Weston but for the hospitality of this rose garden so that we can say our prayers here and we pray at this time for all those who will spend this day in any kind of trouble or need, those in situations of war and the Ukraine we think of, we also think of uh, Israel and Palestine and, the, and, and Gaza, all those areas where peace is so desired and the solutions seem so hard. We pray for all those who prepare to make political decisions about that today. Have in mind those you need to offer, those of your friends in any kind of distress and those whom you will remember who have gone on from this life but still bear such an influence in your life that we think of them with great thanksgiving. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you would pray for and those whom you love today and always. Amen. So thanks for your hospitality. It's been great to share morning prayer with you My this pleasure. morning. <laughs> Good. <laughs>